So the title is The Temporary Autonomous Zone, and it begins with a quotation from Nietzsche from his last letter to Cosimo Wagner written on the day that he went insane. This time, however, I come as the victorious Dionysus who will turn the world into a holiday, not that I have much time. Part one, pirate utopias. The sea rovers and corsairs of the 18th century created an information network that spanned the globe. Primitive and devoted primarily to grim business, the net nevertheless functioned admirably. Scattered throughout the net were islands, remote hideouts where ships could be watered and provisioned, booty traded for luxuries and necessities. Some of these islands supported intentional communities, whole mini societies living consciously outside the law and determined to keep it up, even if only for a short but merry life. Some years ago, I looked through a lot of secondary material on piracy, hoping to find a study of these enclaves but it appeared as if no historian has yet found them worthy of analysis. William Burroughs has mentioned the subject, as did the late British anarchist Larry Law, uh, who published a wonderful uh, zine, the name, name escapes me, um, I'll think of it later. Uh, but no systematic research has been carried out. Uh, I retreated to primary sources and constructed my own theory, some aspects of which will be discussed in this essay. I called these settlements pirate utopias. Recently, Bruce Sterling, one of the leading exponents of cyberpunk science fiction, published a near-future romance based on the assumption that the decay of political systems will lead, in a short time from now, to a decentralized proliferation of experiments in living. Giant worker-owned corporations, independent enclaves devoted to data piracy, Green social democrat enclaves, zero work enclaves, anarchist liberated zones, etc. The information economy which supports this diversity is called, in the novel, the net. And the enclaves, and therefore the book's title, are called the I are called islands in the net. And I recommend this book for Sterling, S-T-E-R-L-I-N-G, S -T -E -R -L -I -N -G, Bruce Sterling, Islands in the Net. It's out in the mass market paper desk. The medieval assassins founded a state which consisted of a network of remote mountain valleys and castles separated by thousands of miles in some cases, strategically invulnerable to invasion, connected by the information flow of secret agents, at war with all governments, and devoted only to knowledge. Modern technology, culminating in the spy satellite, makes this kind of autonomy a romantic dream. No more pirate islands. In the future, the same technology, freed from all political control, could make possible an entire world of autonomous zones. But for now, the concept remains precisely science fiction, pure speculation. Are we who live in the present doomed never to experience autonomy, never to stand for one moment on a bit of land ruled only by freedom, are we reduced either to nostalgia for the past or nostalgia for the future, as in science fiction? Must we wait until the entire world is freed of political control before even one of us can claim to know freedom? Logic and emotion unite to condemn such a supposition. Reason demands that one cannot struggle for what one does not know, and the heart revolts at a universe so cruel as to visit such injustice on our generation alone of humankind. To say that I will not be free till all humans or all sentient creatures are free is simply to cave into a kind of nirvana stupor, a fake Buddhism, if you like, to abdicate our humanity, to define ourselves as losers. I believe that by extrapolating from past and future stories about islands in the net, we may collect evidence to suggest that a certain kind of free enclave is not only possible in our time, but also actual. All my research and speculation has crystallized around the concept of the temporary autonomous zone. Despite its synthesizing force for my own thinking, however, I don't intend the temporary autonomous zone to be taken as more than an essay, literally an attempt, a suggestion, almost a poetic fancy. I'm certainly not saying that incidentally uh, that it's the only uh, possible tactic for today's uh, 
radical movement. I'm just saying, suggesting it as one possible real life tactic. Uh, despite the occasional ranterish enthusiasm of my language, I'm not trying to construct political dogma. In fact, I deliberately refrain from defining the temporary autonomous zone. I circle around the subject, firing off exploratory beams. In the end, the temporary autonomous zone is almost self-explanatory. If the phrase became current, it would be understood without difficulty, understood in action. Part two, waiting for the revolution. How is it that the world turned upside down always manages to right itself? Why does reaction always follow revolution, like seasons in hell? Uprising, or the Latin form insurrection, are words used by historians to label failed revolutions, movements which do not match the expected curve, the consensus-approved trajectory, revolution, reaction, betrayal, the founding of a stronger and even more oppressive state, the turning of the wheel, the return of history again and again to its highest form, jackboot on the face of humanity forever. By failing to follow this curve, the uprising suggests the possibility of a movement outside and beyond the Hegelian spiral of that progress which is secretly nothing more than a vicious circle. Sorgo, rise up, surge. In Sorgo, rise up, raise oneself up. A bootstrap operation. A goodbye to that wretched parody of the karmic round, historical revolutionary futility. The slogan, revolution has mutated from toxin, T-O-C-S-I-N, to toxin, T-O-X-I-N. A malign pseudo-gnostic faith trap, a nightmare where no matter how we struggle, we never escape that evil eon, that incubus, the state, one state after another, every heaven ruled by yet one more evil angel. If history is time, as it claims to be, then the uprising is a moment that springs up and out of time, violates the law of history. If the state is history, as it claims to be, then the insurrection is the forbidden moment, an unforgivable denial of the dialectic, shinnying up the pole and out through the smoke hole, a shaman's maneuver carried out at an, an impossible angle to the universe. History says the revolution attains permanence, or at least duration, while the uprising is temporary. In this sense, an uprising is like a peak experience, in Maslow's term, uh, uh, term as opposed to the standard of ordinary consciousness and experience. Like festivals, uprisings cannot happen every day, otherwise they would not be non-ordinary. But such moments of intensity give shape and meaning to the entirety of a life. The shaman returns. You can't stay up on the roof forever. But things have changed. Shifts and integrations have occurred. A difference is made. You will argue, perhaps, that this is a council of despair. What of the anarchist dream, the stateless state, the commune, the autonomous zone with duration, a free society, a free culture, are we to abandon that hope and return for some existentialist act of gratuit? The point is not to change consciousness, but to change the world, you might say. I accept this as a fair criticism. I'd make two rejoinders, nevertheless. First, revolution has never yet resulted in achieving this dream. The vision comes to life in the moment of uprising, but as soon as the revolution triumphs and the state returns, the dream and the ideal are already betrayed. I have not given up hope or even expectation of change, but I distrust the word revolution. Second, even if we replace the revolutionary approach with a concept of insurrection blossoming spontaneously into anarchist culture, our own particular historical situation is not propitious for such a vast undertaking. Absolutely nothing but a futile martyrdom could possibly result now from a head-on collision with the terminal state, the mega-corporate information state, the empire of spectacle and simulation. Its guns are all pointed at us, while our meager weaponry finds nothing to aim at but a hysteresis, a rigid vacuity, a spook capable of smothering every spark in an ectoplasm of information, 
a society of capitulation ruled by the image of the cop and the absorbent eye of the TV screen. In short, we are not touting the temporary autonomous zone as an exclusive end in itself, replacing all other forms of organization, tactics, and goals. We recommend it because it can provide the quality of enhancement associated with the uprising without necessarily leading to violence and martyrdom. The temporary autonomous zone is like an uprising which does not engage directly with the state, a guerrilla operation which liberates an area of land, of time, of imagination, and then dissolves itself to reform elsewhere, elsewhere, before the state can crush it. Because the state is concerned primarily with simulation rather than substance, the temporary autonomous zone can occupy these areas clandestinely and carry on its festal purposes for quite a while in relative peace. Perhaps certain small temporary autonomous zones have lasted whole lifetimes because they went unnoticed, like hillbilly enclaves, because they never intersected with the spectacle, never appeared outside that real life which is invisible to the agents of simulation. Babylon takes its abstractions for realities. Precisely within this margin of error, the temporary autonomous zone can come into existence. Getting the temporary autonomous zone started may involve tactics of violence and defense, but its greatest strength lies in its invisibility. The state cannot recognize it because history has no definition of it. As soon as the temporary autonomous zone is named, represented, mediated, it must vanish. It will vanish, leaving behind it an empty husk, only to spring up again somewhere else, once again invisible because undefinable in terms of the spectacle. The temporary autonomous zone is thus a perfect tactic for an era in which the state is omnipresent and all-powerful and yet simultaneously riddled with cracks and vacancies. And because the temporary autonomous zone is a microcosm of that anarchist dream of a free culture, I can think of no better tactic by which to work toward that goal, while at the same time experiencing some of its benefits here and now. In sum, realism demands not only that we give up waiting for the revolution, but also that we give up wanting it. Uprising? Yes, as often as possible, and even at the risk of violence. The spasming of the simulated state will be spectacular, but in most cases, the best and most radical tactic will be to refuse to engage in spectacular violence, to withdraw from the area of simulation, to disappear. The temporary autonomous zone is an encampment of guerrilla ontologists, strike and run away. Keep moving the entire tribe, even if it's only as data in the web. The temporary autonomous zone must be capable of defense, but both the strike and the defense should both, if possible, evade in the violence of the state, which is no longer a meaningful violence. The strike is made at structures of control, essentially at ideas. The defense is invisibility, a martial art, invulnerability, an occult art within the martial arts the nomadic war machine, as Deleuze and Jacques call it, conquers without being noticed and moves on before the map can be adjusted. As to the future, only the autonomous can plan autonomy, organize for it, create it. It's a bootstrap operation. The first step is somewhat akin to Satori, the realization that the temporary autonomous zone begins with a simple act of realization. Part three, the psychotopology of everyday life. The concept of the temporary autonomous zone arises first out of a critique of revolution and an appreciation of the insurrection. The former revolution labels the latter insurrection a failure. But for us, uprising represents a far more interesting possibility from the standard of the psychology of liberation than all the successful revolutions of bourgeoisie, communists, fascists, etc. The second generating force behind the temporary autonomous zone springs from the historical development I call the closure of the map, the closing up of the map. 
The last bit of earth unclaimed by any nation state was eaten up in 1899 by Chile, as it happened. Ours is the first century without terra incognita, without a frontier. Nationality is the highest principle of world governance. Not one speck of rock in the South Seas can be left open. Not one remote valley, not even the moon and planets. This is the apotheosis of territorial gangsterism. Not one square inch of earth goes unpoliced or untaxed, in theory. The map is a political abstract grid, a, a gigantic con enforced by the carrot stick conditioning of the expert state. Until for most of us, the map becomes the territory, no longer Turtle Island, but the USA. And yet, because the map is an abstraction, it cannot cover Earth with one-to-one -one accuracy. Within the fractal complexities of actual geography, the map can see only dimensional grids. Hidden and folded immensities escape the measuring rod. The map is not accurate. The map cannot be accurate. So, revolution is closed, but insurgency is open. For the time being, we concentrate our force on temporary power surges, avoiding all entanglements with permanent solutions. And the map is closed, but the autonomous zone is open. Metaphorically, it unfolds within the fractal dimensions invisible to the cartography of control. And here we should introduce the concept of psychotopology and topography, psychotopography, as an alternative science to that of the state's surveying and map-making and psychic imperialism. Only psychotopography can draw one-to-one -one maps of reality because only the human mind provides sufficient complexity to model the real. But a one-to-one -one map cannot control its territory because it is virtually identical with its territory. It can only be used to suggest in the sense to gesture towards certain features. We are looking for spaces, geographic, social, cultural, or even imaginal, uh, with potential to flower as autonomous zones. And we are looking for times in which these spaces are relatively open, either through neglect on the part of the state, or because they have somehow escaped notice by the map makers, or for whatever reason. Psychotopology is the art of dowsing for potential temporary autonomous zones. <coughs> the closures of revolution and of the map, however, are only the negative sources of the temporary autonomous zone. Much remains to be said of its positive inspirations. Reaction alone cannot provide the energy needed to manifest a temporary autonomous zone. An uprising must be for something as well. One, first we can speak of a natural anthropology of the temporary autonomous zone. The nuclear family is the base unit of consensus society, but not of the temporary autonomous zone. Quote, families, how I hate them, the misers of love. Unquote, André Gilles. The nuclear family with its attendant Oedipal miseries appears to have been a Neolithic invention, a response to the agricultural revolution with its imposed scarcity and its imposed hierarchy. The Paleolithic, the Old Stone Age model, is at once more primal and more radical. It is the band. The typical hunter-gatherer nomadic or semi-nomadic band consists of about 50 people. Within larger tribal societies, the band structure is fulfilled by clans within the tribe or by sodalities such as initiatic or secret societies, hunt or war societies, gender societies, children's republics, so-called, and so on. If the nuclear family is produced by scarcity and results in miserliness, the band is produced by abundance and results in prodigality. The family is closed by genetics, by the male's possession of women and children, by the hierarchic totality of agricultural industrial society. The band, however, is open, not to everyone, of course, but to the affinity group, the initiates, sworn to a bond of love. The band is not a part of, uh, of a larger hierarchy, 
but rather part of a horizontal pattern of custom, extended kinship, contract and alliance, spiritual affinity, etc. And the American Indian Society preserves some, some aspects of this structure even now, for a close example. In our own post-spectacular society of simulation, many forces are working, largely invisibly, to phase out the nuclear family and bring back the band. Breakdowns in the structure of work resonate in the shattered stability of the unit home and unit family. One's band nowadays includes friends, ex-spouses and lovers, people met at different jobs and powwows, affinity groups, special interest networks, mail networks, etc. The nuclear family becomes more and more obviously a trap, a cultural sinkhole, a neurotic secret implosion of split atoms. And the obvious counter strategy emerges spontaneously in the almost unconscious rediscovery of the more archaic and yet more post industrial possibility of the band. Two, the temporary autonomous zone as festival. The American anarchist Stephen Pearl Andrews once offered as an image of anarchist society the dinner party in which all structures of authority <laughs> dissolve in conviviality and celebration. Uh, here we might also evoke uh, Fourier and his concept of the senses as the basis of social becoming, touch rut and gastroscopy, and his peon to the neglected implications of smell and taste. And if you don't know the works of Charles Fourier, F-O-U-R, F-O-U-R-I-D-R, I recommend very highly, a, a mid early 19th century French uh, utopian thinker. Uh, the ancient concepts of jubilee and Saturnalia originate in an, in an intuition that certain events lie outside the scope of profane time, the measuring rod of the state and of history. These holidays, literally occupied gaps in the calendar, intercalary intervals. By the Middle Ages, nearly a third of the year was given over to holidays in Europe. Perhaps the riots against calendar reform had less to do with the famous 11 lost days than with the sense that imperial science was conspiring to close up these gaps in the calendar where the people's freedoms had accumulated. A coup d'etat, a mapping of the year, a seizure of time itself, turning the organic cosmos into a clockwork universe, the death of the festival. Participants in insurrection invariably note its festive aspects, even in the midst of armed struggle, danger, and risk. The uprising is like a Saturnalia which has slipped loose or been forced to vanish from its intercalary interval, and is now at liberty to pop up anywhere or when. Freed of time and place, it nevertheless possesses a nose for the ripeness of events, and an affinity for the genius loci. The science of psychotopology indicates flows of forces and spots of power, to borrow occultist metaphors, which localize the temporary autonomous zone spatio-temporally, or at least, help to define its relation to moment and locale. The media invite us to come celebrate the moments of your life with the spurious unification of commodity and spectacle, the famous non-event of pure representation. In response to this obscenity, we have, on the one hand, the spectrum of refusal uh, and on the other hand, the emergence of a festal culture removed and even hidden from the would-be managers of our leisure. Fight for the right to party is in fact not a parody of the radical struggle, but a new manifestation of it, appropriate to an age which offers TVs and telephones as ways to reach out and touch <laughs> other human beings, ways to be there. Pearl Andrews was right. The dinner party is already the seed of the new society taking shape within the shell of the old, quote the IWW preamble. The 60s styles tribal gathering, the forest conclave of echo saboteurs, the idyllic belting of the neo-pagans, the anarchist conference, gay fairy circles, Harlem rent parties of the 1920s, nightclubs, banquets, 
old time libertarian picnics. We should realize that all these are already liberated zones of a sort, or at least potential temporary autonomous zones. Whether open only to a few friends like a dinner party or to thousands of celebrants like a BM, the party is always open because it is not ordered. It may be planned, but unless it happens, it's a failure. The element of spontaneity is crucial. The essence of the party, face to face, a group of humans synergize their efforts to realize mutual desires, whether for good food and cheer, dance, conversation, the arts of life, perhaps even for erotic pleasure, or to create a communal artwork, or to attain the very transport of bliss. In short, a union of egoists, as, Stern, as Max Stern put it, in its simplest form, or else in Kropotkin's terms, a basic biological drive to mutual aid. I see no contradiction between these two ideas. And here we should also mention Bataille's economy of excess and his theory of potlatch culture. I'm sorry, I just simply haven't got time to go into all these possible digressions. <laughs> Three, vital in shaping temporary autonomous zone reality is the concept of psychic nomadism, or as we jokingly call it, rootless cosmopolitanism, a term I borrowed from Stalin, as I pointed out the other day. I'm quite proud to consider myself as a rootless cosmopolitan. Aspects of this phenomenon have been discussed by Deleuze and Gattari in Nomadology and the War Machine. I'll be happy to give these references to anyone later if they want them. By Leotard in Driftworks, and by various authors in the Oasis issue of Semiotex. We use the term psychic nomadism here rather than urban nomadism or nomadology or driftwork. Uh, simply in order to garner all these concepts into a single loose complex to be studied in light of the coming into being of the temporary autonomous zone. The death of God, in some ways a decentering of the entire European project, opened a multi-perspective post-ideological worldview, able to move ruthlessly from philosophy to tribal myth, from natural science to Taoism, uh, able to see for the first time through eyes like some golden insects, each facet giving a view of an entirely other world. But this vision was attained, actually this is what Guillermo was talking about, borders, you know, multiple, multiple realities with borders. Uh, but this vision was attained at the expense of inhabiting an epoch, our epoch, where speed and commodity fetishism have created a tyrannical false unity which tends to blur all cultural diversity and individuality so that one place is as good as another. This paradox creates gypsies, psychic travelers driven by desire or curiosity, wanderers with shallow loyalties, in fact, disloyal to the European project, which has lost all its charm and vitality not tied down to any particular time and place, in search of diversity and adventure. This description covers not only the X-class artists and intellectuals, but also migrant laborers, refugees, the so-called homeless, tourists, the RV and mobile home culture, also people who travel via the net, but may never leave their own rooms, or those who have traveled much in Concord, as Thoreau says, and finally, it includes everybody, all of us, living through our automobiles, our vacations, our TVs, books, movies, telephones, changing jobs, changing lifestyles, religions, diets, etc., etc., psychic nomadism, as a tactic, what Deleuze and Gattari metaphorically call the war machine, shifts the paradox from a passive to an active and perhaps even violent mode. Gods. God, in quotation mark, God's last throes and deathbed rattles have been going on for such a long time, in the form of capitalism, fascism, and communism, for example, that there's still a lot of creative destruction to be carried out by post-Bakuninist, post-Nietzschean commandos, or Apaches, the word that literally means enemies of the old consensus. These nomads practice the razia, the rage, 
They are corsairs. They are viruses. They have both need and desire for temporary autonomous zones. Camps of black tents under the desert stars. Interzones. Hidden fortified oases along secret caravan routes. Liberated bits of jungle and bad land. No-go areas. Black markets. And underground bazaars. <coughs> These nomads chart their courses by strange stars, which might be luminous clusters of data in cyberspace, or perhaps hallucinations. Lay down a map of the land. Over that, set a map of political change. Over that, a map of the net, especially the counter net, with its emphasis on clandestine information flow and logistics. And finally, over all, the one-to-one -one map of the creative imagination, aesthetics, values. The resultant grid comes to life, animated by unexpected eddies and surges of energy, coagulations of light, secret tunnels, surprises. Part four, the net and the web. <coughs> The next factor contributing to the temporary autonomous zone is so vast and ambiguous that it needs a section unto itself. We have spoken of the net, which can be defined here as the totality of all information and communication transfer. Some of these transfers are privileged and limited to various elites, which gives the net a hierarchic aspect. Other trans transactions are open to all, so the net has a horizontal or non-hierarchic aspect as well. Military and intelligence data are restricted, as, as are banking and currency information and the like. But for the most part, the telephone, the postal system, public data banks, etc., are accessible to everyone and anyone. Thus, within the net, there has begun to emerge a shadowy sort of counter net, which we will call the web as if the net were a fishing net and the web were spider webs woven through the interstices and broken sections of the net. Generally, we use the term web to refer to the alternate horizontal open structure of info exchange, the non-hierarchic network, and reserve the term counter net to indicate clandestine, illegal, and rebellious usage of the web, including actual data piracy, and other forms of parasitic leeching off the net itself. Net, web, and counter net are all parts of the same whole pattern complex. They blur into each other at innumerable points. The terms are not meant to define, to define areas, but to suggest tendencies. Uh, digression. Before you condemn the web or the counter net for its parasitism, which can never be a truly revolutionary force, Ask yourself exactly what production consists of in the age of simulation. What is the productive class? Perhaps you'll be forced to admit that these terms seem to have lost their meaning. In any case, the answers to such questions are so complex that the temporary autonomous zone tends to ignore them altogether and simply pick up what it can use. Culture is our nature, and we are the thieving magpies or the hunter-gatherers of the world of contact. The present forms of the unofficial web are, one must suppose, still rather primitive. The marginal Z network, the BBS networks, the computer bulletin boards, pirated software, hacking, phone freaking, some influence in print and radio, almost none in the other big media. No TV stations, no satellites, no fiber optics, no cable, etc., etc. However, the net itself presents a pattern of changing, evolving relations between subjects or users and objects or data. The nature of these relations has been exhaustively explored from McLuhan to Virilio. It would take pages and pages to prove what by now everyone knows. Rather than rehash it all, I am interested in, in asking how these evolving relations suggest modes of implementation for the temporary autonomous zone. The temporary autonomous zone has a temporary but actual location in time, 
and a temporary but actual location in space. But clearly, it must also have location in the web. And this location is of a different sort, not actual, but virtual, not immediate, but instantaneous. The web not only provides logistical support for the temporary autonomous zone, it also helps bring it into being. Crudely speaking, one might say that the temporary autonomous zone exists in information space as well as in the real world. The web can compact a great deal of time as data into an infinitesimal space. You think it's possible for we have noted to that the temporary autonomous like zone, because it is temporary, must necessarily lack some of the advantages of a freedom which experiences oh, yeah. duration yeah. in a more or less fixed locale. But the web can provide a kind of substitute for some of this duration and locale. It can inform the temporary autonomous zone from its inception with vast amounts of compacted time and space which have been subtilized because that doesn't mean brevity literally, it means boiled down to its essence alchemically. At this moment in the evolution of the web, when considering our demands for the face-to-face -face and the sensual, we must consider the web primarily as a support system capable of carrying information from one temporary autonomous zone to another, or defending the zone, rendering it invisible, or giving it teeth, as the situation might demand. But more than that, if the temporary autonomous zone is a nomad camp, then the web helps provide the epics, songs, genealogies, and legends of the tribe. It provides the secret caravan routes and raiding trails, which make up the flow lines of tribal economy. It even contains some of the very roads they will follow, some of the very dreams they will experience as signs and portents. The web does not depend for its existence on any computer technology. Word of mouth, mail, the marginal zine network, phone trees, and the like already suffice to construct an information web work. The key is not the brand or level of tech involved, but the openness and horizontality of the structure. Nevertheless, the whole concept of the net implies the use of computers. In the sci-fi imagination, the net is headed for the condition of cyberspace, as in Tron, the movie, or Neuromancer by William Gibson, and the pseudo-telepathy of virtual reality. As a cyberpunk fan, I can't help but envision reality hacking playing a major role in the creation of temporary autonomous zones. Like Gibson and Sterling, I am assuming that the official net will never succeed in shutting down the web or the counter net. That data piracy, unauthorized transmissions, and the free flow of information can never be frozen. In fact, as I understand it, chaos theory predicts that any universal control system is impossible. However, leaving aside all mere speculation about the future, we must face a very serious question about the web and the tech it involves. The temporary autonomous zone desires above all to avoid mediation, to experience its, its existence as, it wants to experience its existence as immediate. So you think about this, media, mediation that means something is in between you and it. Immediate means there's nothing in between you and it. The very essence of the affair is breast to breast, as the Sufis say, or face to face. But, but, the very essence of the web is mediation. Machines here are our ambassadors. The flesh is irrelevant, except as a terminal with all the sinister connotations of that term. The temporary autonomous zone may perhaps best find its own space by wrapping its head around two seemingly contradictory attitudes toward high tech and its apotheosis of the net. One, what we might call the fifth estate, neo-paleolithic, post-situationist, ultra-green position, uh, <laughs> which construes itself as a Luddite argument against mediation and against the net and against all technology. And two, the cyberpunk utopianists, futuro-libertarians, 
reality hackers and their allies who see the net as a step forward in evolution and who assume that any possible ill effects of mediation can be overcome, at least once we've liberated the means of production. The Tim Leary position, if you're familiar with Robert Anton Wilson. The temporary autonomous zone agrees with the hackers because it wants to come into being in part through the net, even through the mediation of the net. But it also agrees with the greens because it retains an intense awareness of itself as body, and it feels only revulsion for what I call cyber gnosis, the attempt to transcend the body through instantaneity and simulation. The temporary autonomous zone tends to view the tech-anti-tech -tech dichotomy as misleading, like most dichotomies, in which apparent opposites turn out to be falsifications or even hallucinations caused by semantics. This is a way of saying that the temporary autonomous zone wants to live in this world, not in the idea of another world, some visionary world born of false unification, all green or all metal, which can only be more pie in the sky by and by, or as Alice put it, jam yesterday or jam tomorrow, but never jam today. The temporary autonomous zone is utopian in the sense that it envisions an intensification of everyday life, or as the surrealists might have said, life's penetration by the marvelous. But it cannot be utopian in the actual meaning of the word, nowhere, literally, no place, place. The temporary autonomous zone is somewhere. It lies at the intersection of many forces, like, uh, like some pagan power spot at the junction of mysterious ley lines, visible to the adept in seemingly unrelated bits of terrain, landscape, flows of air, water, animals. But now the lines are not all etched in time and space. Some of, the, some of them exist only within the web, even though they also intersect with real times and places. Perhaps some of the lines are non-ordinary, in the sense that no convention for quantifying them exists. These lines might better be studied in the light of chaos science than of sociology, statistics, economics, or the like. The patterns of force which bring the temporary autonomous zone into being have something in common with those chaotic, strange attractors which exist, so to speak, between the dimensions. The temporary autonomous zone, by its very nature, seizes every available means to realize itself. It will come to life, whether in a cave or an L5 space city. But above all, it will live, now or as soon as possible, in however suspect or ramshackle a form, spontaneously, without regard for ideology or even anti-ideology. It will use the computer because the computer exists but it will also use powers which are so completely unrelated to alienation or simulation that they guarantee a certain psychic paleoism to the temporary autonomous zone, a primordial shamanic spirit which will infect even the net itself, and that is the true meaning of cyberpunk as I read it. Because the temporary autonomous zone is an intensification, a surplus, an excess, a potlatch, life spending itself in living rather than merely surviving that sniveling shibboleth of the 80s. It cannot be defined either by tech or anti-tech. It contradicts itself like a true despiser of hobgoblins because it wills itself to be at any cost in damage to perfection, to the immobility of the final. In the Mandelbrot set, how many are familiar with the Mandelbrot set? Ooh, dear, not too many. Ooh, I'm sorry. It's, uh, it can't be explained briefly. Yeah, it can't be explained briefly, so I'm sorry. You just have to sort of hopefully get it from your context. In the Mandelbrot set and its computer graphic realization, we watch in a fractal universe maps which are embedded and in fact hidden within maps within maps within maps within maps within maps, 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 maps etc. to the limits of computational power. What is it for? this map, which in a sense bears a one-to-one -one relation with a fractal dimension. What can one do with it other than admire its psychedelic elegance? 
If we were to imagine an information map, a cartographic projection of the net in its entirety, we would have to include in it the features of chaos, which have already begun to appear, for example, in the operations of complex parallel processing, telecommunications, transfer of electronic money, viruses, guerrilla hacking, and so on. Each of these areas of chaos could be represented by topographs similar to the Mandelbrot set, such that peninsulas are embedded or hidden within the map, such that they seem to disappear. This writing, parts of which vanish, parts of which efface themselves, represents the very process by which the net is already If nothing else, the Mandelbrot set serves as a metaphor for a mapping of the temporary autonomous zone's interface with the net as a disappearance of information. Let me read that again. If nothing else, the Mandelbrot set serves as a metaphor for a mapping of the temporary autonomous zone's interface with the net as a disappearance of information. Every so-called catastrophe in the net is a potential node of power for the web or the counter net. The net will be damaged by chaos, or the web may thrive on it. Whether through simple data piracy or else by a more complex development of actual rapport with chaos, the web hacker, the cybernetician of the temporary autonomous zone, will find ways to take advantage of perturbations, crashes, and breakdowns in the net, ways to make information out of entropy. As a bricoleur, a scavenger of information shards, smuggler, blackmailer, perhaps even cyber terrorist, the, TA, the temporary autonomous zone hacker will work for the evolution of clandestine fractal connections. These connections and the different information that flows among and between them will form power outlets for the coming into being of the temporary autonomous zone itself, as if one were to steal electricity from the energy monopoly to light an abandoned house for squatters. Thus, the web, in order to produce situations conducive to the temporary autonomous zone, will parasitize the net. But we can also conceive of this strategy as an attempt to build toward the construction of an actual alternative and autonomous net, free and no longer parasitic which will serve as the basis for a new society emerging from the shell of the old. The count, uh, this, this concept is being worked on under the name of hypercard uh, at the moment. The counter net and the temporary autonomous zone can be considered, practically speaking, as ends in themselves, but theoretically they can also be viewed as forms of struggle toward a different reality. Having said this, we must still admit to some qualms about computers, some still unanswered questions, especially about the personal computer, the PC. The story of computer networks, BBSs, and various other experiments in electro-democracy has so far been one of hobbyism, for the most part. Many anarchists and libertarians have deep faith in the PC as a weapon of liberation and self-liberation but no real gains to show, no palpable increment of liberty. I have little interest in some hypothetical emergent entrepreneurial class of self-employed data word processors who will soon be able to carry on a vast cottage industry of piecemeal shit work for various corporations and bureaucracies. Moreover, it takes no ESP to foresee that this class will develop its underclass, a sort of lump in the upatariat. <laughs> Housewives, for example, who will provide their families with second incomes by turning their own homes into electro sweatshops, little, little work tyrannies where the boss is a computer network. Also, I am not impressed by the sort of information and services proffered by contemporary radical networks. Somewhere, one is told, there exists an information economy, maybe so. But the info being traded over the alternative BBSs 
seems to consist entirely of chit chat and techie talk. This is an economy, or merely a pastime for enthusiasts. Okay, PCs have created yet another print revolution. Okay, marginal web works are evolving. Okay, I can now carry on six phone conversations at once. But what difference has this made in my everyday life? Frankly, I already had plenty of data to enrich my perceptions. What with books, movies, TV, theater, telephones, the U.S. Postal Service, altered states of consciousness, and so on. Do I really need a PC in order to obtain yet more such data? Oh, you offer me secret information? Well, perhaps I'm tempted. But still, I demand marvelous secrets, not just unlisted telephone numbers, or the trivia of cops and politicians. Most of all, I want computers to provide me with information linked to real goods, the good things of life, as the IWW preamble puts it. And here, since I'm accusing the hackers and BBSers of irritating intellectual vagueness, I must myself descend from the Baroque clouds of theory and critique and explain what I mean by real goods. Let's say that for both political and personal reasons, I desire good food better food than I can obtain from capitalism. Unpolluted food still blessed with strong and natural flavors. To complicate this game, imagine that the food I crave is illegal. Raw milk, perhaps, which is, I think, still illegal in most places in America. Or the exquisite Cuban fruit, mame, which can't be imported fresh into the U.S. because it's seen as hallucinogenic, or so on so Now, I'm not a farmer. Let's pretend I'm an importer of rare perfumes and aphrodisiacs, and sharpen the play by assuming that most of my, my stock is also illegal. Or maybe I only want to trade word, process, word processing services for organic turnips, but I refuse to report the transaction to the IRS, as required by law, believe it or not. Or maybe I want to meet other humans to engage in consensual but illegal acts of mutual pleasure. This has actually been tried, but all the hard-set BBSs have been busted, and what use is an underground network with lousy security? In short, assume that I'm fed up with mere information, the ghost in the machine. Now, according to you, computers should already be quite capable of facilitating my desires for food, drugs, sex, tax evasion. So what's the matter? Why is it that happening? <laughs> The temporary autonomous zone has occurred, is occurring, and will occur with or without the computer. But for the temporary autonomous zone to reach its full potential, it must become less a matter of spontaneous combustion and more a matter of islands in the net. The net, or rather the counter net, assumes the promise of an integral aspect of the temporary autonomous zone, an addition that will multiply its potential, a quantum jump, Odd how this expression has come to mean a big leap in complexity and significance. The temporary autonomous zone must now exist within a world which is dominated by pure speed as well as in the world of pure space, the world of the senses. Liminal, meaning in between, or borderline, borderline, even evanescent. The temporary autonomous zone must combine information and desire in order to fulfill its adventure, its happening, in order to fill itself to the borders of its destiny, to saturate itself with its own becoming. Perhaps the neo-Paleolithic school are correct when they assert that all forms of alienation and mediation must be destroyed or abandoned before our goals can be realized. Or perhaps true anarchy will be realized only in outer space, as some future libertarians assert. But the temporary autonomous zone does not concern itself very much with was or will be. The temporary autonomous zone is interested in results, successful raids on consensus reality, breakthroughs into intenser and more abundant life. <clears throat> if the computer cannot be used in this project, then the computer will have to be overcome. My intuition, however, suggests that the counter net is already coming into being, perhaps already exists but I cannot prove it. I've based the theory of the temporary autonomous zone in large part on this intuition. 
Of course, the web also involves, as I said before, non-computerized networks of exchange, such as Samizdat or self-publishing, the black market, etc. But the full potential of non-hierarchic information networking logically leads to the computer as the tool par excellence. Now I'm waiting for the hackers to prove I'm right, that my intuition is valid. Where are my turnips? <laughs> uh, how long have I been going on? Anybody been timing this? About an hour. About an hour. Do you want to take a 10 minute break and then do the next hour and a half? Or do you want to go on? Who would like a break? And who really feels adamantly anti break? Okay, let's have a 10 minute break. <laughs> let's have a 10 minute break. Called well, Gone to Croatan. What's that word there? Croatan. It's a place name, and I will explain it in due course. We have no desire to define the temporary autonomous zone or to elaborate dogmas about how it must be created. Our contention is rather that it has been created, will be created, and is being created. Thank you. Therefore, it would prove more valuable and interesting to look at some examples of temporary autonomous zones, past and present, and to, uh, and to speculate about future manifestations by evoking a few prototypes we may be able to gauge the potential scope of the complex and perhaps even get a glimpse of an architect. Rather than attempt any sort of encyclopedism, we'll adopt a scattershot technique, a mosaic of glimpses, beginning quite arbitrarily with the 16th, 17th centuries and the settlement of the New World. The opening of the New World was conceived from the start as an occultist operation. The Magus John Dee, spiritual advisor to Queen Elizabeth I, seems to have invented the concept of magical imperialism and infected an entire generation with it. Halkirk, the famous map maker, and Sir Walter Raleigh fell under his spell, and Raleigh used his connections with the so-called School of Night, a cabal of advanced thinkers, aristocrats, and adepts, to further the causes of exploration, colonization, and map making. Shakespeare's Tempest was a propaganda piece for this new ideology. And the Roanoke colony was its first showcase experiment. The alchemical view of the new world associated it with materia prima, or haile, the state of nature, innocence, and all possibility, virgin yeah. Virgin, yeah. A chaos or inchoateness which the adept would transmute into gold, that is, into spiritual perfection as well as material abundance. But this alchemical vision is also informed in part by an actual fascination with the inchoate, a sneaking sympathy for it, a feeling of yearning for its formless form, which took the symbol of the Indian for its focus man in the state of nature, uncorrupted by government, Caliban, the wild man, is lodged like a virus in the very machine of occult imperialism. The forest animal humans are invested from the very start with the magic power of the marginal, despised and outcast. On the one hand, Caliban is ugly and nature a howling wilderness, as the Puritans said. On the other, Caliban is noble and unchained in nature and Eden. This split in European consciousness predates the romantic classical dichotomy. It's rooted in Renaissance high magic. The discovery of America, El Dorado, the fountain of youth, crystallized it and it precipitated in actual schemes for colonization. We were taught in elementary school, I suppose some of you might remember this also, that the first settlements in, in Roanoke, uh, the first settlement in Roanoke failed, that the colonists disappeared, leaving behind them only the cryptic message, gone to Croatan. Later, reports of gray-eyed Indians were dismissed as legend, at least they were in my high school textbook. What really happened, the textbook implied, was that the Indians massacred the defenseless settlers. However, Croatan was not some El Dorado. It was the name of a neighboring tribe of friendly Indians, 
Apparently, the settlement was simply moved back from the coast into the great dismal swamp and absorbed into the tribe. And the gray-eyed Indians were real. They're still there. And they still call themselves the Crow Towns. So, the very first colony in the New World chose to renounce its contract with Prospero, the Raleigh Empire, and go over to the wild men with Caliban. They dropped out. They became Indians, went native, opted for chaos, over the appalling miseries of surfing for the plutocrats and intellectuals of London. As America came into being where once there had been Turtle Island, Crochan remained embedded in its collective psyche, out beyond the frontier, the state of nature, i.e. no state, still prevailed. And within the consciousness of the settlers, the option of wildness always lurked, the temptation to give up on church, farm work, literacy, taxes, all the burdens of civilization, and go to Croatan in some way or another. Moreover, as the revolution in England was betrayed, first by Cromwell and then by Restoration, waves of Protestant radicals fled or were transported to the New World, which had now become a prison, a place of exile. Antinomians, familists, rogue fakers, levelers, diggers, and ranters were now introduced to the occult shadow of wildness, and they rushed to embrace it. Anne Hutchison and her friends were only the best known, i.e. the most upper class, of the antinomians, having had the bad luck to be caught up in Bay Colony politics, but a much more radical wing of the movement clearly existed. The incidents Hawthorne relates in the Maypole of Marymount, how many of you remember that, with the required reading in my school? God damn, only one person has read Hawthorne's Marymount? Jack, do you read it? He never read your hand. He read the language. Well, um, gee, it's, uh, to put it briefly, a bunch of extremely radical Protestant mystics uh, seceded from the Bay Colony and ran into the woods and joined up with the Indians and uh, built a maypole. And they were dancing around it together, um, white settlers and, and red Indians together, when they were raided by the Puritans and more or less wiped out. So well, that, that's the gist of the story. Um, and these, uh, these incidents are thoroughly historical. Apparently, the extremists had decided to renounce Christianity altogether and revert to paganism. If they had succeeded in uniting with their Indian allies, the result might have been an antinomian Celtic Algonquin syncretic religion, a sort of 17th century North American Santeria, uh, or, or voodoo. Um, I've, since writing this, I've found one wonderful example of that. Uh, Nathan Barlow, the New England mystic, led the squatters of Kennebec County in Maine during the 1790s against the sheriffs and land agents of the out-of-state proprietors in small bands of armed white Indians. He wrote, quote, every man to his right and privileges and liberty, the same as our Indian nation enjoys, unquote. They burned barns, rescued prisoners, upset courts, and destroyed writs into atoms. Barlow was known as the Indian King. Sectarians were able to thrive better under the looser and more corrupt administrations in the Caribbean, where rival European interests had left many islands deserted or even unclaimed. Barbados and Jamaica, in particular, must have been settled by many extremists, religious extremists. And I believe that levelerish and ranterish influences contributed to the buccaneer utopia on Tortuga. Here, for the first time, thanks to a writer named Eskimelian, who was there and wrote a book about it, we can study a successful proto-temporary autonomous zone in some depth. Fleeing from the hideous benefits of imperialism, such as slavery, serfdom, racism, and intolerance, from the tortures of impressment and the living death of the plantations, the buccaneers adopted Indian ways, intermarried with the Caribs, accepted blacks and Spaniards as equals, rejected all nationality, elected their captains democratically, and reverted to the state of nature. 
having declared themselves at war with all the world, that's a direct quote, they sailed forth to plunder under mutual contracts called articles, which were so egalitarian that every member received a full share and the captain usually only one and a half shares. Now, I should, to make that fact really meaningful, I should mention that the privateers, who were like pirates with a license to practice piracy from the government, uh, against the enemies of that government. For example, let's say uh, John Paul Jones, who was a privateer for the American colonial, uh, their uh, revolutionary government, and he preyed only on British ships. And in those ships, the, uh, the uh, breakdown of profits between captain and crew was 40 shares for the captain to one share for the crew. Uh, so the pirates were a full share for the crew versus only one and a half shares, or even one and a quarter in some cases, for the captain. And the captain, some of them lasted only a few weeks. <laughs> I mean, uh, if they didn't come through with profits, they were either de-elected or tossed off the ship. You know. uh, flogging and punishments were forbidden. This is something that very few people know about the pirates. Uh, they were so fed up with the uh, sadism of the navies that most of them had escaped from, especially the British Navy, that they forbade all punishments. Quarrels were settled by vote or by the code duello. Fight it out, man to man. Or woman to woman, actually. There were women pirates as well. It is simply wrong to brand the pirates as mere seagoing highwaymen or even proto-capitalists, as some historians have done. In a sense, they were social bandits. Although their base communities were not traditional peasant societies, but rather utopias created almost ex nihilo in terra incognita, out of nothing in the unknown parts of the world, enclaves of total liberty occupying empty spaces on the map. After the fall of Tortuga, the Buccaneer ideal remained alive all through the so-called golden age of piracy, about 1660 to 1720, and resulted in land settlements in Belize, for example, which was actually founded by Buccaneers, and is a the word Belize is a corruption of the, of the name Wallace, who's uh, one of the buccaneers, who was uh, among the first settlers there. Uh, then, as the scene shifted to Madagascar, an island on the whole entirely other side of the world, an island still unclaimed by any imperial power and ruled only by a patchwork of native kings or chieftains eager for pirate allies, the pirate utopia reached its highest form. Daniel Defoe's account of Captain Mission and the founding of Libertatia may be, as some historians claim, a literary hoax meant to propagandize the radical Whig theater. But uh, it, this story, the story of Captain Mission, was embedded in the general history of the pirates, which Defoe published in two volumes between 1724 and 28, immediately after the so-called Golden Age of Piracy. Most of this is still accepted as true and accurate. Moreover, the story of Captain Mission was not criticized when the book appeared, and many old Madagascar hands still, still survive. They seem to have believed it, no doubt because they had experienced pirate enclaves very much like libertation. What was it like? Once again, reduced, uh, rescued slaves, natives, and even traditional enemies such as the Portuguese were all invited to join as equals. Liberating slave ships was a major preoccupation. Land was held in common. Representatives elected for short terms, booty shared out equally. Doctrines of liberty were preached, far more radical than even those of, of common sense, which, which came a generation later. Libertatia hoped to endure, and mission died in its defense. Now, by the way, Burroughs has written this up somewhere, so some of you may have come across this story. I forget which book it is. Right. But most of the pirate utopias were meant to be temporary. In fact, the Corsairs' true republics were their ships, which sailed under the Articles. The shore enclaves usually had no law at all. The last classic example, Nassau in the Bahamas, a beachfront resort of shacks and tents devoted to wine women and probably boys too, to judge by Burge's Sodomy and Piracy, an interesting book, Song, the pirates were inordinately fond of music and used to hire on bands for entire cruises and wretched excess vanished overnight when the British fleet appeared in the bay. Blackbeard and Calico Jack Rackham and his crew of pirate women moved on to wilder shores and nastier fakes. 
while others meekly accepted the pardon and the reform. But the buccaneer tradition lasted, both in Madagascar, where the mixed blood of children of the pirates began to carve out kingdoms of their own, and in the Caribbean, where escaped slaves, as well as mixed black, white, red groups, were able to thrive in the mountains and backlands as maroons. You may have heard this term. There are still, well, the maroon community in Jamaica, for example, still retains a degree of autonomy in many of the old folkways when Zora Neale Houston visited there in the 1920s. And you can read about that in her marvelous book, Tell My Horse. And I've been talking to a few people recently who tell me the Maroons are still there, still very independent-minded with their own folkways and their feeling of being somehow autonomous. Throughout the 18th century, North America also produced a number of dropout, so-called tri-racial isolate communities. Now, uh, tri-racial isolate communities. This clinical sounding term was in invented by the eugenics movement, which produced the first scientific studies of these communities. Unfortunately, the science merely served as an excuse for hatred of racial mongrels and the poor, and the solution to the problem was usually forced sterilization. Uh, some of these laws are still on the books in America, by the way. The nuclei of these communities invariably consisted of runaway slaves and serfs, that is, blacks and whites, criminals, that is to say, the very poor, prostitutes, that is to say, white women who married non-whites, and members of various native tribes. In some cases, such as the Seminole and Cherokee, the traditional tribal structure absorbed the newcomers. In other cases, new tribes were formed. Thus, we have the Maroons of the Great Dismal Swamp, who persisted through the 18th and 19th centuries, adopting runaway slaves, functioning as a way station on the Underground Railway, and serving as a religious and ideological center for slave rebellions. The religion was hoodoo, a mixture of African, native, and Christian elements. And according to the historian Hugo Leading Bay, the elders of the faith and the leaders of the Great Dismal Maroons were known as the Seven Finger High Glister. I always love that name, I have to in. The Seven Finger High Glister. The Ramapos of northern New Jersey, incorrectly known as the Jackson Whites, present another romantic and archetypal genealogy. Freed slaves of the Dutch poltroons, various Delaware and Algonquin clans, the usual prostitutes, the Hessians, a catchphrase for lost British mercenaries, dropout loyalists, etc., and local bands of social bandits, such as Claudius Smith, a little bit of lost American history here. An African Islamic origin is claimed by some of these groups, such as the Moors of Delaware, and the Ben Ishmaels, who migrated from Kentucky to Ohio in the mid-18th mid century. The Ishmaels practiced polygamy, never drank alcohol, made their living as minstrels, intermarried with Indians and adopted their customs, and were so devoted to nomadism that they built their houses on wheels. <laughs> not, not carriages, houses on wheels. Their annual migration triangulated on frontier towns with names like Mecca and Medina. In the 19th century, some of them espoused anarchist ideals, and they were targeted by the eugenicists for a particularly vicious pogrom of salvation by extermination. Some of the earliest eugenics laws were passed in their honor. As a tribe, they disappeared in the 1920s, but probably swelled the ranks of early black Islamic sects, such as the Moorish Science Temple. I myself grew up on legends, legends of the Calicacs of the nearby New Jersey Pine Barrens, and of course on H.P. Lovecraft, a rabid racist who was fascinated by these isolated communities. The legends turned out to be folk memories of the slanders of the eugenicists, a very recent sort of legend, whose U.S. headquarters were in Vineland, New Jersey, and who undertook the usual reforms against miscegenation and feeble-mindedness in the barrens, including the publication of photographs of the Calicats crudely and obviously retouched to make them look like monsters of misbreeding. A wonderful book, if you ever see it, the, uh, the Calicats uh, of New Jersey, I think it's called, or the Calicats of the Pine Barrens. And you can actually see the pencil marks that have been added under the eyes and the cheeks to make these people look you know, really bizarre. They're just normal, poor, rural people. You know. 
the isolate communities, at least those which have retained their identity into the 20th century, consistently refuse to be absorbed either into the mainstream culture or the black subculture into which modern sociologists prefer to categorize them. In the 1970s, inspired by the Native American Renaissance, a number of groups, including the Moors and the Ramapos, applied to the Bureau of Indian Affairs for recognition as Indian tribes. They received support from Native activists, in the, especially in the AIM, but were refused official status. If they'd won, after all, it might have set a dangerous precedent for dropouts of all sorts, from white peyotists and hippies to black nationalists, Aryans, anarchists, libertarians, a reservation for anyone and everyone. The European project cannot recognize the existence of the wild man. Green chaos is still too much of a threat to the imperial dream of order. Essentially, the Moors and the Ramapos rejected the diachronic or historical explanation of their origins in favor of a synchronic self-identity based on a myth of Indian adoption. Or to put it another way, they named themselves Indians. If everyone who wished to be an Indian could accomplish this, uh, this by an act of self-naming, imagine what a departure to Croatan would take place. That old occult shadow still haunts the remnants of our forests, which, by the way, have greatly increased in the Northeast since the 18, 18th and 19th century, as a vast tracts of farmland return to scrub. Thoreau, on his deathbed, dreamed of the return of Indians, forests, those were his last words, the return of the repressed. The Moors and the Ramapos, of course, have very good materialist reasons to think of themselves as Indians. After all, they have Indian ancestors. But if we view their self-naming in mythic as well as historical terms, we'll learn more of relevance to our quest for the temporary autonomous zone. Within tribal societies, there exist what some anthropologists call meninbunden, totemic, totemic societies devoted to an identity with nature in the act of shape-shifting, of becoming the totem animal, werewolves, jaguar shamans, leopard men, cat witches. In the context of an entire colonial society, as Michael Tausig points out in his wonderful book, Shamanism, Colonialism, and the Wild Man, the shape-shifting power is seen as inhering in the native culture as a whole, rather than in the shamans only. Thus, the most repressed sector of the society acquires a paradoxical power through the myth of its occult knowledge, which is feared and desired by the colonists. Of course, the natives really do have certain occult knowledge, but in response to the imperial perception of native culture as a kind of spiritual wildness, spiritual wilderness, the natives come to see themselves more and more consciously in that role. Uh, until you get to the uh, uh, Native Americans of today who have, who have appointed themselves guardians of the environment. Why not? Even as they are marginalized, the margin takes on an aura of magic. Before the white man, they are simply tribes of people. Now they are guardians of nature, inhabitants of the state of nature. Finally, the colonist himself is seduced by this myth. Whenever an American wants to drop out, or back into nature, invariably he becomes an Indian. The Massachusetts radical Democrats, the spiritual descendants of the radical Protestants, who organized the Tea Party, and who literally believed that governments could be abolished. The whole Berkshire region of Massachusetts declared itself in a state of nature at one point. What did these guys do? They disguised themselves as Mohawks. Thus the colonists, who suddenly saw themselves marginalized vis-a-vis -vis the motherland, adopted the role of the marginalized natives, thereby, in a sense, seeking to participate in their occult power, their mythic radiance. From the mountain men to the Boy Scouts, the dream of becoming an Indian flows beneath a myriad strands of American history, culture, and consciousness. The sexual imagery connected to these tri-racial groups also bears out this hypothesis. Now, natives, of course, are always immoral, as we know, but racial renegades and dropouts must be downright polymorphous perverse. The buccaneers were buggers. The maroons and mountain men were misogynists. 
The dukes and calicacs indulged in fornication and incest, leading to mutations such as polydactyly, six fingers. The children ran around naked and masturbated openly, etc., etc. It actually says this in some of these wonderful old uh, eugenics books. You can read about all these shocking proofs of racial degeneration. Uh, reverting to a state of nature paradoxically seems to allow for the practice of every unnatural act. Or so it would appear if we believe the Puritans and the Genesists. And since many people in repressed, moralistic, racist societies secretly desire exactly these licentious acts, they project them outwards onto the marginalized and thereby convince themselves that they themselves remain civilized and pure. And in fact, some marginalized communities do really reject consensus morality. The pirates certainly did and no doubt actually act out some of civilization's repressed desires. <laughs> Becoming wild is always an erotic act, an act of nakedness. Before leaving the subject of the triracial isolates, I'd like to recall Nietzsche's enthusiasm for race mixing. Impressed by the vigor and beauty of hybrid cultures, he offered miscegenation not only as a solution to the problem of race, but also as the principle for a new humanity, freed of ethnic and national chauvinism, a precursor to the psychic nomad, perhaps. Nietzsche's dream still seems as remote now as it did to him. Chauvinism still rules okay. Mixed cultures remain submerged, but the autonomous zones of the Buccaneers and Maroons, the Ishmaels and Moors, the Ramapos and Calicats remain, or their stories remain, as indications of what Nietzsche might have called the will to power as disappearance. We must return to this theme. Chapter 6, Music as an Organizational Principle. Meanwhile, however, we turn to the history of classical anarchism in the light of the temporary autonomous zone concept. Before, before the closure of the map, a good deal of anti-authoritarian energy went into the escapist communes, such as Modern Times, the various philanthropists, the Oneida community, you know, so hundreds of them, you know, all over America. Uh, interestingly, some of them were not intended to last forever, but only as long as the project proved fulfilling. By socialist utopian standards, these experiments were failures, and therefore we know little about them. When escape beyond the frontier proved impossible, the era of, in other words, when all the terra incognita had been eaten up around the turn of the 18th, or somewhere around the middle of the 18th century, this became, began, uh, 19th century, or this began to become obvious, then the era of revolutionary urban communes began in Europe, 1848, the commune, and then even more so, 1870. The communes of Paris, Lyon, and Marseille did not survive long enough to take on any characteristics of permanence, and one wonders if they were really meant to. From our point of view, the chief matter of fascination is the spirit of the communes. During and after these years, anarchists took up the practice of revolutionary nomadism, drifting from uprising to uprising, looking to keep alive in themselves the intensity of spirit they experienced in the moment of insurrection. In fact, certain anarchists of the Sternerite Nietzschean strain came to look on this activity as an end in itself, a way of always occupying an autonomous zone, the interzone, which opens up in the midst or wake of war and revolution, or, or pigeons of zone in Gravity's Rainbow, for example, is a very nice fictional uh, realization of this concept. Uh, they declared that if any socialist revolution succeeded, that would be the first to turn against it. Uh, in fact, there's a wonderful story about Bakunin, I think it was in uh, uh, Lyon, uh, as, the, as, the, as the revolution is succeeding, all the uh, rebels are trucking uh, arms and guns into the center of the city, they meet Bakunin with a, a wheelbarrow full of guns going out of the city. And they said, What's, what are you doing? Where are you going? He said, I'm going up into the hills to get ready for the next one. <laughs> so this was the, uh, this was the attitude. Um, Short of universal anarchy, they had no intention of ever stopping. 
In Russia, in 1917, they greeted the free Soviets with joy. Ah, this was their goal. But as soon as the Bolsheviks betrayed the revolution, the individualist anarchists were the first to go back on the warpath. After Kronstadt, of course, when Tolstoy, uh, when Trotsky ordered the Red Army to fire on the anarchists, uh, of, of course, all, all anarchists then began to condemn the Soviet Union, which they saw as a contradiction in terms, and moved on in search of new insurrections. And the Goldman ended up in Spain, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, Nestor Machno in the Ukraine and, and the anarchists in Spain, um, the, the situations that they established were meant to have duration. And despite the exigencies of continual war, both succeeded to a certain extent. Not that they lasted a long time, but they were successfully organized and they could have persisted, I believe, if not for outside aggression. In every case, by the way, it was the Marxists who ruined it, not the fascists. Uh, therefore, from among the social experiments of the interwar period, I will concentrate, rather than these uh, more well-known anarchist uh, events, I will concentrate instead on the madcap Republic of Fiume, F-I-U-M-E, which is much less well-known. In fact, I'll wait no one who's ever heard of it unless they've known me for a long time. Anybody ever hear about Fiume before? Uh, it is much less well known and it was not meant to endure. Gabriele D'Annunzio, decadent poet, artist, musician, esthete, womanizer, pioneer daredevil aeronautist, black magician, genius, and cad. In, if you don't know this guy, you've got to get into him. He emerged from World War I as a hero with a small army at his beck and command, so called Arditi. At a loss for adventure, in the war with the war being over, he decided to capture the city of Fiume from Yugoslavia and give it as a free gift to Italy. After a necromantic ceremony with his mistress in a cemetery in Venice, <laughs> He set out to conquer Fiume and succeeded without any trouble to speak of. But Italy turned down his generous offer. The prime minister dared to call him a fool. In a huff, D'Annunzio decided to declare independence and see how long he could get away with it. He and one of his anarchist friends wrote the constitution which declares music to be the central principle of the state. <laughs> The Navy, made up of deserters and Milanese anarchist maritime unionists, uh, named themselves the Uscochi, after the long-vanished pirates who once lived on local offshore islands and preyed on Venetian and Ottoman shipping. This is why I consider Fiume to be a pirate in Tokyo, because they thought, they thought they were pirates. So they were pirates. Um, the modern Uscochi succeeded in some wild and unexpected coups. Several rich Italian merchant vessels suddenly gave the Republic a future, money in the coffers. Artists, bohemians, adventurers, anarchists, fugitives, stateless refugees, homosexuals, military dandies, the uniform was black with pirate skull and crossbones, an idea later stolen by the SS and crank reformers of every stripe, including Buddhists, Theosophists, and Vedantists, began to show up at Fiume in droves. The party never stopped. Every morning, D'Annunzio read poetry and manifestos from his balcony, every evening a concert, then fireworks. This made up the entire activity of the government. <laughs> Eighteen months later, when the wine and money had run out and the Italian fleet finally showed up and lobbed a few shells at the municipal palace, no one had the energy to resist. <laughs> I just don't have the energy to resist. Nothing on this in English, by the way. There's some biographies of Domenzio which I've managed to glean this stuff from, but there's no single work on Fiume, unfortunately. A good job for somebody who knows Italian. The Nunzio, like many Italian anarchists, later veered toward fascism. In fact, Mussolini, himself an ex-syndicalist, uh, seduced the poet along that route. <coughs> By the time the Nunzio realized his error, it was too late. He was too old and too sick. But El Duce, having killed anyway, pushed off a balcony <coughs> and uh, turned him into an instant martyr. 
As for Fiume, although it lacked the seriousness of the free Ukraine or Barcelona, it can probably teach us more about certain aspects of our quest. It was in some ways the last of the pirate utopias, or the only modern example. In other ways, perhaps it was very nearly the first modern temporary autonomous zone. I believe that if we compare Fiume with the Paris uprising of 1968, or also the Italian urban insurrections of the early 70s, as well as with the American countercultural communes and their anarcho new left influences, you should notice certain similarities amongst all these things, such as the importance of aesthetic theory, uh, the idea that the music could be the, the driving force was also extremely common in the 60s. When rock and roll was going to change the world. Also, what might be called pirate economics, living high off the surplus of social overproduction. Uh, even the popularity of colorful military uniforms. Think of the covers of certain Beatle albums where they're all dressed up as funny-looking soldiers. Uh, and finally, their shared air of impermanence, of being ready to move on, shapeshift, relocate to other universities, mountaintops, ghettos, factories, safe houses, abandoned farms, or even other planes of reality. No one was trying to impose in any of these places yet another revolutionary dictatorship. Not at Fiume, not at Paris, not at Millbrook, where Tim Leary was, uh, was at the time, uh, running the economy. Um, either the world would change, or it wouldn't. Meanwhile, keep on the move, and live intensely. The Munich Soviet, or Council Republic of 1919, exhibited certain features of the temporary autonomous zone, even though, like most revolutions, its stated goals were not exactly temporary. Gustav Landauer's participation as Minister of Culture, along with Silvio Gessel as Minister of Economics, and other anti-authoritarian and extreme libertarian socialists, such as Newsom and the playwright Toller, gave the Munich Soviet a distinct anarchist flavor. Landauer, who had spent years of isolation working on his grand synthesis of Nietzsche, Proudhon, Kropotkin, Stirner, Meister Eckhart, the radical mystics, and the romantic Volk philosophers, knew from the start that the Soviet was doomed. He hoped only that it would last long enough to be understood. Kurt Eisner, the martyred founder of the Soviet, believed quite literally that poets and poetry should form the basis of the revolution. Plans were launched to devote, no wonder they shone, plans were launched to devote radicals like Martin Buber, the expressionists, and, uh, and other artistic types, and other marginals. Thus, historians dismiss it as the coffee house republic and belittle its significance by comparison with Marxist and Spartacist participation in Germany's post-war revolution, or revolutions, according to the Republicans. Outmaneuvered by the communists, and eventually murdered by soldiers under the influence of the occult fascist fool society, Landauer deserves to be remembered as a saint. Yet even anarchists nowadays tend to misunderstand and condemn him for selling out to a socialist government. In fact, he's a completely forgotten man, really. If the Soviet had lasted even a year, we would weep at the mention of its beauty. But before even the first flowers of that spring had wilted, the geist and the spirit of poetry were crushed by the communists. And we have forgotten. Imagine what it must have been to breathe the air of a city in which the Minister of Culture has just predicted that school children will soon be memorizing the works of Walt Whitman. Ah, for a time machine. Chapter 7, The Will to Power as Disappearance. Foucault, Baudrillard, and others have discussed various modes of disappearance at great length. Here I wish to suggest that the temporary autonomous zone is in some sense a tactic of disappearance. When the theorists speak of the disappearance of the social, the popular phrase in Europe now, they mean, in part, the, the impossibility of the social revolution and, in part, the impossibility of the state. They mean the abyss of power, the end of the discourse of power. The anarchist question in this case should then be, why bother to confront a power which has lost all meaning and become sheer simulation? Such confrontations will only result in dangerous and ugly spasms of violence 
by the empty-headed shit for brains who have inherited the keys to all the armories and prisons. Perhaps this is a crude American misunderstanding of sublime and subtle Franco-Germanic fear. If so, fine. Whoever said understanding was needed to make use of an idea. As I read it, this appearance seems to be a very logical, radical option for our time, not at all a disaster or death for the radical project. Unlike the morbid, death-freak, nihilistic interpretation of theory, mine intends to mine it for useful strategies in the always ongoing revolution of everyday life. The struggle that cannot cease, even with the last failure of political or social revolution, because nothing except the end of the world can bring an end to everyday life, nor to our aspirations for the good things, for the marvelous. And, as Nietzsche said, if the world could come to an end, logically it would have done so. It has not, so it does not. And so, as one of the Sufis said, no matter how many drafts of forbidden wine we drink, we will carry this raging thirst into eternity. Certain anarchist writers, uh, John Zerzan and Bob Black to be specific, have independently noted certain elements of refusal, which perhaps can be seen as somehow symptomatic of a radical cultural culture of disappearance. These, these um, elements of refusal are partly unconscious but partly conscious. Uh, this culture of disappearance influences far more people than any leftist or anarchist idea. These gestures are made against institutions and in that sense are negative. But each negative gesture also suggests a positive tactic to replace rather than merely refuse the despised institutions. For example, the negative gesture against schooling is voluntary illiteracy. Uh, since I do not share the liberal worship of literacy for the sake of social ameliorization, I cannot quite share the gasps of dismay heard everywhere at this phenomenon. I sympathize with children who refuse books along with the garbage in the books. There are, however, positive alternatives which make use of the same energy of disappearance, homeschooling and craft apprenticeship, like truancy, result in an absence from the prison of school. Hacking is another form of education with certain features of invisibility. A mass-scale negative gesture against politics consists simply of not voting. Apathy, that is to say, a healthy boredom with the weary spectacle, keeps over half the nation from the polls. Anarchism never accomplished as much. Nor did anarchism have anything to do with the failure of the recent census, which cost billions of dollars and only uh, was six, only 60% uh, active. Again, there are positive parallels. Networking, uh, or as I prefer to say, web working, as an alternative to politics, is practiced at many levels of society. A non-hierarchic organization has attained popularity even outside the anarchist movement simply because it works. Act Up and Earth First are two examples. Alcoholics Anonymous, oddly enough, is another. Refusal of work can take the forms of absenteeism, on-job drunkenness, sabotage, sheer inattention, but it can also give rise to new modes of rebellion, more self-employment, participation in the black economy, and lavoronero, as the uh, Italians call it, the black work, it's, uh, the untaxed work. Welfare scams and other criminal options, pot farming, etc., all more or less invisible activities compared to traditional leftist confrontational tactics, such as the general strike. Refusal of the church? Well, the negative gesture here probably consists of watching television. But the positive alternatives include all sorts of non-authoritarian forms of spirituality, from unchurched Christianity to neo-paganism. The free religions, as I like to call them, Small, self-created, half-serious, half-fun cults influenced by such currents as Discordianism and Anarcho-Taoism anarcho are to be found all over marginal America and provide a growth even in, even in man forward, and provide a growing fourth way outside uh, the mainstream churches, the televangelical bigots, and New Age vapidity and consumerism. 
It might also be said that the chief refusal of orthodoxy consists of the construction of private moralities in the, in the Nietzschean sense, the spirituality of free spirits. The negative refusal of home is homelessness, which most consider a form of victimization, not wishing to be forced into nomadology. But homelessness can, in a sense, be a virtue, an adventure. So it appears, at least, to the huge international movement of the squatters, our modern hobos. The negative refusal of the family is clearly divorce or some other symptom of breakdown. The positive alternative springs from the realization that life can be happier without the nuclear family, whereupon a hundred flowers bloom, from single parentage to group marriage to erotic affinity groups. The European project fights a major rearguard action in defense of family. Edible misery lies at the heart of control. Alternatives exist, but they must remain in hiding, especially since the war against sex of the 1980s and 90s. What is the refusal of art? The negative gesture is not to be found in the silly nihilism of an art skirt or the defacing of some famous painting. It is to be seen in the almost universal glassy-eyed boredom that creeps over most people at the very mention of the word. But what would the positive gesture consist of? Is it possible to imagine an aesthetics that does not engage, that removes itself from history and even from the market, or at least tends to do so, which wants to replace representation with presence? How does presence make itself felt even in or through representation? How does presence make itself felt even in representation? Now, um, here comes the difficult part. Chaos linguistics. How many people heard my talk on chaos linguistics last year? You know, a fair number of lucky people who will know more about what I'm saying than the rest of you. Or unlucky people. You know. Chaos linguistics trace, traces a presence which is continually disappearing from all orderings of language and meaning systems. An elusive presence, evanescent, latif, means subtle in Arabic, the term of Sufi alchemy. The strange attractor around which memes accrue, chaotically forming new and spontaneous orders. Here we have an aesthetics of the borderland between chaos and order, the margin, the area of catastrophe, where the breakdown of the system can equal enlightenment. Now, I've written a note. For an explanation of chaos linguistics, see Appendix A. Then please read this paragraph again. So that's what I'll do for you. Chaos linguistics. Not yet a science, but a proposition. That certain problems in linguistics might be solved by viewing language as a complex dynamical system or chaos field. Of all the responses to Ferdinand de Saussure's linguistics, two have special interest here. The first, anti-linguistics, as I call it, can be traced in the modern period from Rambo's departure for Abyssinia to Nietzsche's, I fear that while we still have grammar, we have not yet killed God, to Dada, to Korzybski's, the map is not the territory, to Burroughs' cut-ups and the breakthrough in the gray room, and finally to John Zerzan's attack on language itself as representation and mediation. The second, Chomskyan linguistics, with its belief in deep grammar and its upside down tree diagrams, represents, I believe, an attempt to save language by discovering hidden invariables, much in the same way certain scientists are trying to save physics from the irrationality of quantum mechanics. Although, as an anarchist, Chomsky might have been expected to side with the nihilists, in fact, his beautiful theory has more in common with Platonism or Sufism than with anarchism. Traditional metaphysics describes language as pure light shining through the colored glass of the archetypes. Chomsky speaks of innate grammars. I don't see any difference. Words are like leaves, branches are sentences, mother tongues are limbs, language families are trunks, and the roots are in heaven, or the DNA. I call this idea hermetolinguistics, hermetic and metaphysical. Nihilism, or heavy metal linguistics, in honor of Burroughs, heavy metal linguistics, get it? 
<laughs> seems to me to have brought language to a dead end and threatened to render it impossible. A great feat, but a depressing one. While Chomsky holds up the promise and hope of a last-minute revelation, which I find equally difficult to accept, I too would like to save language, but without recourse to any spooks or supposed rules about God, dice, and the universe. Returning to Saussure and, the, and his posthumously published notes on anagrams in Latin poetry, we find certain hints of a process which somehow escapes the sign-signifier dynamic. Saussure was confronted with the suggestion of some sort of meta-linguistics which happens within language rather than being imposed as a categorical imperative from outside. As soon as language begins to play, as in these acrostic poems which he was examining, it seems to resonate with self-amplifying complexity. Saussure tried to quantify the anagrams in the poetry, but his figures kept running away from him as if perhaps non-linear equations were involved. Also, he began to find the anagrams everywhere, even in Latin prose. He began to wonder if he were hallucinating, or if anagrams are somehow a natural, unconscious process of parole, of speech itself, of, of, of language, of language is speech, writing is speech. So he abandoned the project, which uh, was never published in his lifetime. I wonder, if enough of this sort of data were crunched through a computer, would we begin to be able to model language in terms of complex dynamical systems? Grammars then would not be innate, but would emerge from chaos as spontaneously evolving higher orders in Perdogian's sense of creative evolution. Grammars could be thought of as strange attractors, like the hidden pattern which caused the anagrams, in some series of examples. Patterns which are real, but have existence only in terms of the sub-patterns they manifest. If meaning is elusive, perhaps it is because consciousness itself, and therefore language, is fractal or chaotic. <clears throat> I find this theory more satisfyingly anarchistic than either the anti-linguistics or Chomskyanism. It suggests that language can overcome representation and mediation, not because it is somehow innate, but because it is chaos. It would suggest that all Dadaistic experimentation, uh, Fair Abin described his school of scientific epistemology as anarchistic Dada. Are you, anybody familiar with Fair Abin, the, the historian of science? A very intriguing writer whose work has recently been brought back into print. Uh, it would suggest that all Dadaistic experimentation in sound poetry, gesture, cut up, beast languages, etc. All this was aimed neither at discovering nor destroying meaning, but at creating it. Nihilism points out gloomily that language arbitrarily creates meaning. Chaos linguistics happily agrees, but adds that language can overcome language, that language can create freedom out of semantic tyrannies, confusion, and decay. Okay, that's chaos linguistics. And now we'll go back and... Uh, read that uh, paragraph again. Chaos linguistics traces a presence which is continually disappearing from all orderings of language and meaning systems. An elusive presence, evanescent, latif, or subtle, a term in Sufi alchemy, the strange attractor around which means accrue, chaotically forming new and spontaneous orders. Here we have an aesthetics of the borderland between chaos and order, the margin, the area of catastrophe, where the breakdown of the system can equal enlightenment. The disappearance of the artist is the suppression and realization of art, as the situationists like to call it. Uh, and let me, that also needs just a little explanation. In, in, in 68, the situationists talked about the suppression and realization of art. What they meant was that art would be suppressed as a commodity structure of galleries and so forth, and realized in terms of everyone's individual creativity. Uh, so what I'm saying is that the realization of this dream of the suppression and realization of art does involve, or in fact is identical with, somehow the disappearance of the artist. But from whence do we vanish? And are we ever seen or heard of again? 
We go to Croatan. What's our fate? All our art consists of a goodbye note to history. Gone to Croatan. But where is it? And what will we do there? First, we're not talking here about literally vanishing from the world in its future. There is no escape backward in time to some Paleolithic original leisure society. There is no forever utopia, no back mountain hideaway, not even Bolinas. No island, also no post-revolutionary utopia, most probably no revolution at all. Also, no vonu, is a popular phrase in the early 70s, meaning voluntary disappearance into the woods. Some people actually did. No anarchist space stations, nor do we accept some kind of Baudrillardian disappearance into the silence of an ironic hyperconformity. I have no quarrel with any Rambeau who can escape art for whatever abyss inia they can find. But we can't build an aesthetics, even an aesthetics of disappearance, on the simple act of never coming back. Some energy escapes even from black holes. In other words, we're not merely anticipating the disappearance of art, but also its realization. By saying that we're not an avant-garde and that there is no avant-garde, we have written our Gone to Croatan. The question then becomes how to envision everyday life in Croatan, particularly if we cannot say that Croatan exists in time, either Stone Age or post-revolution, or space, either as utopia or as some forgotten Midwestern town, or as Abyssinia. Where and when is the world of unmediated creativity? If it can exist, it does exist, but perhaps only as a sort of alternate reality which we so far have not learned to perceive. Where would we look for the seeds, the weeds, cracking through our sidewalks from this other world into our world? The clues, the right directions for searching, the finger pointing at the moon. I believe, or would at least like to propose, that the only solution to the suppression and realization of art lies in the emergence of the temporary autonomous zone. I would strongly reject the criticism that the temporary autonomous zone itself is nothing but a work of art, although it may have some of the trappings. I do suggest that the temporary autonomous zone is the only possible time and place for art to happen for the sheer pleasure of creative play and as an actual contribution to the forces which allow the temporary autonomous zone to cohere and manifest. Art in the world of art has become a commodity, but deeper than that lies the problem of representation itself and the refusal of all mediation. In the temporary autonomous zone, art as commodity will simply become impossible. It will instead be a condition of life. Mediation is harder to overcome, but the removal of all barriers between artists and users of art will tend toward a condition in which, as A.K. Kumaraswamy described it, quote, the artist is not a special sort of person, but every person is a special sort of artist, unquote. In sum, disappearance is not necessarily a catastrophe, except in the mathematical sense of a sudden topological change. All the positive gestures sketched here seem to involve various degrees of invisibility rather than traditional revolutionary confrontation. The new left never really believed in its own existence till it saw itself on the evening news. The new autonomy, by contrast, will either infiltrate the media and subvert it from within, or else will never be seen at all. The temporary autonomous zone exists not only beyond control, but also beyond definition, beyond gazing and naming as acts of enslaving, beyond the understanding of the state, beyond the state's ability to see. Conclusion. Rat holes in the Babylon of information. The temporary autonomous zone as a conscious radical tactic will emerge under certain conditions. One, psychological liberation. That is, we must realize or make real 
the moments and spaces in which freedom is not only possible, but actual. We must know in what ways we are genuinely oppressed, and also in what ways we are self-repressed, or ensnared in a fantasy in which ideas oppress us. Work, for example, is a far more actual source of misery for most of us than legislative politics. Alienation is far more dangerous for us than toothless, outdated, dying ideologies. Mental addiction to ideals, which in fact connect the mere projections of our resentment and sensations of victimization, will never further our project. The temporary autonomous zone is not a harbinger of some pie-in-the-sky social utopia to which we must sacrifice our lives that our children's children may breathe a bit of free air. The temporary autonomous zone must be the scene of our present autonomy, but it can only exist on the condition that we already know ourselves as free beings. Two, the counter net must expand. At present, it reflects more abstraction than actuality. Zines and BBSs exchange information, which is part of the necessary groundwork for the temporary autonomous zone, but very little of this information relates to concrete goods and services necessary for the autonomous <coughs> life. We do not live in cyberspace. To dream that we do is to fall into cybergnosis, the false transcendence of the body. The temporary autonomous zone is a physical place, and we are either in it or not. All the senses, all the senses must be involved. The web is like a new sense in some ways, but it must be added to the others. The others must not be subtracted from it, as in some horrible parody of the mystic trance. Without the web, the full realization of the, TAZ, of the temporary autonomous zone complex would be impossible. But the web is not the end in itself. It's a weapon. Three, the apparatus of control, the state, must, or so we must assume, continue to deliquesce and petrify simultaneously, must progress on its present course in which hysterical rigidity comes more and more to mask a vacuity, an emptiness, an abyss of power. As power disappears, our will to power must be disappearance. As power disappears, our will to power must be disappearance. We've already dealt with the question of whether the temporary autonomous zone can be viewed merely as a work of art. But you will also demand to know whether it is more than some poor rat hole in the Babylon of information, or rather a maze of tunnels more and more connected, but devoted only to the economic dead end of piratical parasitism. I'll answer that I'd rather be a rat in the wall than a rat in the cage. But I'll also insist that the temporary autonomous zone transcends these categories. A world in which the temporary autonomous zone succeeded in putting down roots might resemble the world envisioned by the Swiss science fiction author P.M. in his fantasy novel Bolo Bolo, which I recommend very highly. I don't have time to describe it now. Uh, but inasmuch as the, as the temporary autonomous zone exists now, it stands for much more than the mundanity of negativity or countercultural dropoutism. We have mentioned the festal, the festive, festival aspect of the moment, which is uncontrolled and which adheres in spontaneous self-ordering, however brief. It is epiphanic, a peak experience on the social as well as individual scale. Liberation is realized in struggle. This is the essence of Nietzsche's self-overcoming. The present thesis might all also take for a sign Nietzsche's wandering. It is the precursor of the drift in the situation's sense of the derive and Lyotard's definition of drift work. We can foresee a whole new geography, a kind of pilgrimage map in which holy sites are replaced by peak experiences and temporary autonomous zones. A real science of psychotopography, perhaps to be called geo-autonomy or anarchomancy. The temporary autonomous zone involves a kind of ferality, a growth from tameness to wildness or wilderness, a return which is also a step forward. It also demands a yoga of chaos, 
a project of higher orderings of consciousness or simply of life, which are approached by surfing the wave front of chaos, of complex dynamism. The temporary autonomous zone is an art of life in continual rising up, wild but gentle, a seducer, not a rapist, a smuggler rather than a bloody pirate, a dancer, not an eschatologist. Let us admit that we have attended parties where for one brief night a republic of gratified desires was attained. Shall we not confess that the politics of that night have more reality and force for us than those of, say, the entire U.S. government? Some of the parties we've mentioned lasted for two or three years. Is this something worth imagining, worth fighting for? Let us study invisibility, web working, psychic nomadism, and who knows what we might attain. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, my one question is uh, about a uh, microphone. Oh, yes, use the mic. The television and telephone are uh, considered kind of tools of the spectacle, but um, virtual reality and cyberspace are kind of an extension of that. Do you think that cyberspace and virtual reality are so can, be, can become so highly advanced that they transgress that? Uh, and, uh, of mediation? Yeah. I don't see how, because they'll still have machines which will mediate between you and it, whatever the it is. I mean, mediation is really a very simple concept. It means just something in between you and it. That's what the media are. And uh, I don't see how virtual reality, even in its most uh, whacked out science fictional imagination, and I read a lot of, of, of science fiction, uh, I still don't see how you could ever say that it's going to transcend mediation or even alienation. The hope is that it, that it, uh, that by horizontalizing control of the technical aspects of these things, that we can somehow keep that mediation under under our control, rather than having it used as a control over us. Now, this, as I say, is a utopian view, um, propagated as you know by, by Bob Wilson and Kinnear and the whole Smile group and all that. Uh, and uh, although I have lots of misgivings and even fears about that, uh, about their optimistic viewpoint, I like it just because it's optimistic. You know? I like it because it's not uh, that they're not pitching the moment about the future. They're actually eager to get to it. You know? And this is this is something at least to me admirable. Uh, whether whether the technology, whether this advanced you know virtual reality and cyberspace kind of tech is going to end up enslaving us even worse, or whether we're going to manage to keep control of it and some sort of electro-democracy will emerge. I have no idea, as I said, it's all pure speculation. But all I'm saying now is that there's a struggle, at least a potential struggle, for control and design, design and control. And maybe uh, there should be a poetics of computer technology, maybe that's something that's needed. I was wondering how your uh, idea of the zone would fit in with contemporary Marxist theory, such as that of Frederick Jameson, in which something like a zone would be seen as dissent and therefore automatically assimilable by the uh, capital structure, that uh, any kind of subversion only provides the containment structure or the state with a justification for its own existence. That's very well put. Um, there is that danger, of course. Uh, that's why I say that the temporary autonomous zone, as soon as it's named, will disappear. As soon as you can say there is an area of dissent that we can fence off and commercialize, commodify it, and sell it back as a, as a fake produce to the people who want it, like health food, was, like, like what was known as health food, with natural food. You know. There is an area of dissent. 
in, in American history, emerging where you know, literally hundreds of thousands of people were just sick of bad food, in all senses of the word sick, uh, and might have led to some sort of quote unquote revolution. But what was done instead was that uh, all too many post hippie entrepreneurs were willing to uh, produce the same kind of crapola and label it natural, and now uh, we see what the result. Uh, so you're absolutely right. There is this danger, and uh, I wasn't aware that this was a Jamisonian idea, but I mean, it's an idea which is prevalent in, in all thinking on the, on, on, in the radical movement. Co-optation has been a problem since the 60s. That's what they called it back then. Uh, and um, all I can say is that it seems to me that this is, this is precisely where the, where the aspect of invisibility comes in that the temporary autonomous zone is in some sense invisible or else it's doomed because as soon as it becomes visible, as soon as it falls under the gaze of, of, of authority, as soon as it is labeled, as soon as you can produce like, uh, you know, guidebook to American temporary autonomous zones, or tickets to the temporary autonomous zone, you know, kits, do-it-yourself autonomous zone, you know, it's, it's dead, yeah, absolutely, it's dead. So it's a question of this is this is what Leo talked about by drift work. It always must be drifting ahead of this process, and it's not because you're it's not because you're escaping it like an escaped jailbird. It's because you're drifting away from it like a nomad, and there and only there in that nomadic space does this um, problem, which you've outlined from a Marxist point of view, cease to mean anything. And uh, I mean there is a you know. There's a lot of Hegelian Marxist thinking that goes into all of this, but my own feeling is that those questions which would limit the future to a Marxist solution uh, have been eliminated. And that Marxism, in any of these narrow senses, is no longer a chain uh, on our thinking of radicals. Uh, it's dead. Marxism is dead. And what's replaced it is going to make a lot of use of it, but it's not going to be it anymore. And uh, there, therefore, I feel that, um, that uh, as I said, this, to believe in the temporary autonomous zone as a, as a reality in my life doesn't mean that I'm necessarily going to give up the struggle against censorship in public. Because, you know, it doesn't mean that I'm going to give up even the armed struggle if that possibility should arise in a meaningful way, you know, in a way that I can feel has some hope of something, you know, rather than just being shot immediately or put into uh, prison for every minute. But, uh, you know, in, in the absence of those traditional Marxist tactics which seem no longer valid to me, I find the temporary autonomous zone at least is a tactic, not, maybe not the tactic, but a tactic by which even as we struggle towards a liberated society, if such a thing can still be conceived, at least we can enjoy some of the aspects of what we are creating, in other words, it will be the seeds of the new society already emerging within the shell of the old, as, uh, as the IWW said. A syndicalist outfit, not an, not an anarcho individualist outfit, but an anarcho communist outfit. So, really, very close to Marxist thinking. Does that answer the question? Well, I'm sort of have a follow up. Yeah. First of all, it's it, from the political unconscious by Jameson, this very cryptic statement on uh, the politics, of, you know, the logic of the marketplace is where he expresses that idea. And it's also expressed by Grimm and Williams, uh, Elliot Butler Evans. And it's picked up by um, people, neo-historicists like Stephen Greenblatt in his essay, Invisible Bullets, and other neo-historicists. And it seems that in contemporary Marxist thought, there is no revolutionary possibility. It's instead an explanation of history in late capitalist states as a kind of freezing of the possibility, possibility of historical change. So I'm still sort of curious about the origination of the zone itself. Because from this perspective, uh, the zones would have to be ontologically determined by difference and therefore a product of a hegemonic structure. The way you've described it seems to be more deconstructive in that there are fissures in the hegemonic structure that allow for some kind of creation which is not determined. Yeah, could we have a both and here rather than either or? Uh, I mean, in other words, as I said, uh, the, the temporary autonomous zone will make use of the computer because the computer, the computer is here and it's a, it's a tool that's available. Uh, it doesn't mean that the computer is free of all the aspects of late commodity capitalism. By no means does it mean that. What it does mean 
is that uh, by, by combination of, of detournement, of, of, of subversion of commodity structures, along with the existence of these fissures, these cracks in the Babylon of information, uh, somewhere in all of that complexity, that dynamical complexity, the temporary autonomous zone has a chance to emerge, and will emerge because it represents our desire. Yeah. Uh, you've discussed um, the uh, commoditization of the art object and the, uh, the attempts by the situationists and, and, it, and your own ideas to uh, overcome the commoditization of the art object. And uh, my question is, what is your advice to us as young artists um, in order to uh, further the, this wonderful goal, other than, in addition to uh, like self-publishing and magazines? Right, right. <sighs> I remember once I was uh, with Ivan Illich, remember here? Yeah. And he got a telegram from Governor Brown of California asking him to come and be on a TV show and a commission that he was setting up and he was, and he was asking Illich to become the resident guru of California. And Illich just exploded in insane anger as he said that that bloody fellow is following me all over the world and these stupid requests that I turn myself into some kind of guru. And uh, ever since then, I've been really leery of uh, uh, double E, not L-E-R. I've uh, been, really, been really leery of, of giving uh, advice. I mean, I already think I'm going out on a, on a very shaky limb here. Uh, I really do think this essay is full of holes, but, um, you know, it was... Um, I had to do it. I had to write it, even with all those holes. And maybe one of the holes is that I still haven't been specific enough. I guess I haven't, because you're still asking me for advice. Um, and I guess I really, I really don't know. I really, if I knew, you know, uh, then, yeah, then I would have read about that. I would have said something about that. I just want to explain, I'm not asking you to stand up here and be an authority in the whole of that year. I just want to know if you have any thoughts on it. I think all my thoughts are here, you know. I, I'm having, having trouble coming up with yet more thoughts on this subject because I think I've kind of exhausted everything I can say. I really don't want to pin it down. That would be too much like a definition. Uh, I'd really rather prefer to think of, these, uh, of this essay as possibly containing a few useful phrases which might stick in your mind when you come to do what it is you want to do. Uh, I'm sorry if that's unsatisfactory, but um, uh, I really uh, I would feel dishonest in going any farther than that. of all these ideas. Is that, that's a new biography that's come out? Um, yeah, I think in, in the last couple of years, I don't know, I forget the name of it. I remember seeing some reviews of it. I'll have to look for yeah, it. Yeah, these uh, British guys just, uh, you know, didn't exhaust it in a certain sense. Yeah. A lot of people suspected that already. He was afraid of being uh, killed by the Nazis by coming down and killed by him or something. Or by the, by the uh, Thomas. Probably for that matter. I don't know, since I haven't read that book, I don't have any terrific insights. I'm going to be afraid of but uh, I'll look into it. Have you read like the Death Chef or Yeah, I did read the Death Chef a long, long time ago, man. I don't remember very much about it. Uh, any more? Yes, Alan. Uh, Funny question is, uh, what extent is the uh, sitting practice of meditation in temporary autonomous zone? And then what would, what would be the critique of the hierarchy that comes with teaching and practicing and setting up a place to sit? Mm. 
Yeah, I do think that um, I do I do think that, that one can look in radical spiritual traditions for many examples of, of temporary autonomous zones or proto temporary autonomous zones or there could even I suppose it's conceivable that there could even be a one person in a temporary autonomous zone. Uh, but I don't feel like for myself that a religious hierarchy is a necessary um, precursor or precondition for such attainment. Um, I think that in the works of Meister Eckhart or uh, some of the radical Protestants of the 1600s or some of the heretical Sufis that I've examined in my book Scandal, uh, that there are in effect, non-hierarchical spiritual ways. Now, usually these disappear after a generation. And one of the reasons why all these Protestant uh, sects like Levelers and Diggers tended to disappear was because there was no hierarchy. So they didn't survive as churches. They were only movements. But in the end, you know, maybe this was all for the best. I don't know. Uh, maybe that means that these people had their, had their moments of, of joy and fulfillment, and then that reality was exhausted, and history moved on to something else. I mean, I can't help feeling nostalgia for these things. Perhaps if some of these sects were still in existence, I myself would have been a Christian, instead of being attracted to, you know, pouring after strange deities, <laughs> the way I have all my life. Um, but the fact is, they weren't. They didn't survive. They did disappear. Christianity was taken over by a hierarchy. And the result is what we see, that the descendants of all these wild and woolly revolutionaries are now the televangelist Baptists. They're the direct descendants of these people. Um, so, I, you know, the answer is that for me personally, I, I no longer see the necessity of hierarchy to support realization. What hierarchy supports is a permanent structure in which realization could conceivably come about. And that will have a, an existential value to the individual or not, as the case may be. Uh, is that yeah. is that sort of clear? Uh, yeah, I was really interested in your talking about uh, the use of the web as far as um, revolution goes. And what that, rather than having a conflict by arms, it seems as though computer viruses are pretty much an information age weapon. And the fact that the FBI is tracking down on hackers and you know, tapping the phones seems to indicate that even the growth of the web itself is a weapon. Yes. It's just the more people that know about it, the more people that can decide. Yes, it. certainly the FBI is now convinced that, that hacking and, and computer viruses are a very real and present danger. There is an ongoing, at this very moment, federal roundup of hackers which you can read about in Z's like 2600, which you're familiar with that, and other uh, magazines which monitor the hacking, uh, the world of, of the hackers. And um, <coughs> even some of the hackers themselves are horrified by the, uh, by the viruses, uh, which get into their own systems. <laughs> <It's saving them. laughs> uh, so, um, from that point, I think it's always, uh, it's always interesting to see what activities that we can involve ourselves in are actually perceived as real dangers by, the, by, by control. I mean, poetry is, is currently not one such activity. As far as I know, we have no FBI infiltration here at Naropa, but then again, you know. <laughs> uh, I just would find it hard to believe. Actually, organized anarchism is not attracting very much attention from the folks these days. We're almost, you know, like we're insulted. You know, it's, it's like that quote from, from a wonderful quote from Rabelais on, on the mall downtown that I saw. I have no desire to be out of debt. It would be as if no one trusted me. You know, it's like we have no desire to be ignored by the descendants of Conan Telpro. It kind of, you know, it suggests that we're toothless. But uh, there, there it is. You know, we just haven't apparently thought of a tactic which really scares the shit out of you. Maybe that's, you know, I'm trying to sort of suggest things that might. Huh? Well, possibilities of this technology. And I certainly find it worthwhile reading all of that point of view as well as the uh, negative, you know, as I said, neo-Luddites. 
uh, branch of anarchism which just sees all of this as, you know, hopeless delusion and more mediation. I like to, you know, feel that dichotomies like that are somehow misleading, as I said. That somewhere that I, I, I like both these things, so why can't I have both of them? Why do I have to consider them as mutually exclusive? That seems a limited point of view, you know, what Emerson called a hobgoblin for little minds. Uh, yeah. Well, they like to get it on tape. and the person who is the object of the, you know, in this sense is the object of the discourse, uh, which is why he did all those, uh, had, the, had his narrative turn out to address the audience and remind, remind them that it wasn't reality they were seeing, but a play. Uh, so from that point of view, yeah, there was a necessary alienation. I think it's necessary to become alienated from the, from the, from Babylon, which is my code word for all control systems. Uh, and this intense alienation can achieve levels of, of uh, well, like Chioran, you're familiar with his work, the French thinker Chioran, or, uh, or Bata, Bata, and a really excessive extremist uh, proponents of alienation, in a sense. Alienation as a revolutionary, a radical, better word, radical stance. So, yeah, from that point of view, there, is, there could be positive uses of the word alienation. I should have perhaps more specifically, I should have specified that when I used the word alienation, I was copying a, a, a you know, sort of post-Marxist use of the word uh, to mean the, the, the alienation of, of us from our production that goes on in, 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 in commodity fetishism. So, uh, or, you know, in, in the world of, of, of control and co-optation, as, as, as you were saying. So, yeah, that's a double-barreled word, and I apologize for the uh, uh, vagueness with which I used it. Anybody else? What time is it? It's probably at least seven. Oh, it's still quarter to seven. Oh, well, we did it. Okay. <laughs> I think that's it, you know.